Lord, I pray that you'll open the word this morning to our hearts, Lord. Touch us in a special way as we study, Lord. Lord, touch my lips to speak what you would have me to speak this morning. Bless us, Lord, I pray. In your wonderful name. Amen. I'm going to continue this week in uh, Matthew, I believe Matthew 13, is what we're in, on the Kingdom Parables. Last week we talked about the parable of the sower. But there are seven parables in this chapter, and they all relate to the kingdom of God. Some of them were spoken openly to the public, and at the point Jesus took his disciples aside, and some of the parables were given in private. We're going to look at the meaning of some of these. Again, last week we spoke about the parable of the sower and the different ground that the seed fell on. And um, if you want to do a little catch-up, that message is online on the, on the church Facebook page. It's linked on there, and it's also on YouTube. But turn to Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 10. And the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered them, To you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. So he's telling his disciples that to them, those people closely following him, that they were allowed to understand the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to the other people, he spoke in parables because they had to work at understanding it. He didn't give them the explanation. They had to think about it. He would use common um, things that they, under, that they were familiar with, and he'd weave them into a story, and it was up to them to try to figure out what he was teaching them through that story. It says, For whoever has to him, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, does not have even what he has shall be taken away from him. So he's saying for those who understand who Jesus is, those that have, even more is going to be given to them. But those that don't know who he is, eventually will be taken away from them. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and their ears, they, with their ears they scarcely hear. And they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return. And I would heal them. This passage could be talking about where we're at today, especially in this country. In America, the people have become dull in their hearts. They don't perceive the Word of God anymore. Their ears don't hear it anymore. Their eyes don't see it anymore. It's a problem we have in this country right now. And in our churches. Gail and I were talking about this on the way to church this morning. A lot of the churches, they, church, they teach surface things. They don't get into the meat of God's Word. They teach feel-good messages. Messages designed to make you feel good when you go home. And I'm afraid sometimes I'm guilty of not making you feel good. <laughs> when I give a message. But sometimes God's Word doesn't make us feel good. Sometimes, it, like we talked about last week, it breaks up that fallow ground in our hearts so that His Word can take root. And sometimes it does make us feel good. But we need to have open eyes to see what God has for us, open ears to hear what He has for us. So we're going to look at some of these parables the next parable in the seven was the wheat and the tares. Jesus presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while, this, but while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. So what are tares? 
Tares are a plant, there's a picture of wheat and tares, they look similar to the wheat when they're growing and when they're green, but then once they come ripe, you can tell the difference. But the problem is, is they infiltrate in the field and the tares, the seeds from the tares are actually poisonous. So you have to make sure you separated it out from the wheat before you ground the wheat up into flour, or you'd have flour that could make you sick. It says, but when the wheat sprouted and bore grain, then the tares became evident also. The slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, for while you were gathering up the tares, you may uproot the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. <clears throat> Then they asked him, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he said, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. So now he's explaining to him, the person, the sower of the seed is Jesus. And the field is the world. So we see here the field represents the world. This is important when we look at some of these other parables. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. If you accepted Christ as your Savior, you're a son of the kingdom. But we know in the world, among those that follow Christ, is a lot of people who follow the evil. The Bible tells us that you're either for him or against him. You're either serving Christ or you're serving Satan, whether you know it or not. See, Satan doesn't ask you permission to take your life, come into your life. He just comes in by force. But Jesus asks us to receive him into our lives. And when you do that, you are a son of the kingdom. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. So he tells us that the harvest is at the end of the age, when he comes back and he separates the wheat from the tares, and the tares are thrown into eternal fire, and the wheat... It's the reward of salvation. But just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send forth His angels and they will gather out of His kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. And He, ends, he who has ears let him hear. And he ends a lot of these parables that way. He's giving us that, listen to what I'm saying. A lot of people don't believe in an eternal punishment. This is very clear that there's going to be an eternal punishment, a furnace of fire, and a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Sure, we can erase that from the gospel and try to tease it that, oh, there is no eternal punishment. Everybody goes to heaven. It's not what the scriptures teach. And I've had that conversation with many people. They say, oh, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're a good person. It doesn't matter if you're Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu or whatever. If you believe in a God and you're a good person, you're going to go to heaven. No, that's not what the gospel teaches. Jesus was very clear. He said, I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. See, he didn't leave any other options. He says, he is the only way. There is no other way. The problem is, is the enemy has come and sown this message in the world that's a big lie. And people are believing it. And they get mad at the preacher when he tells them it's not the way it is. But it's not my word, it's God's word. My job is just to share God's word. Not to make you feel good and tell you, oh, there's lots of ways to get to heaven. Just be a good person, you'll get there. I'm not going to stand before God and be held accountable for those words because it's not the truth. Amen. When I stand before God, I want to stand and have no one able to point at me and say, you didn't tell me. 
before they go into punishment. See, God's word is God's word. We, we're not allowed to change it. We need to study it and understand it. Not make it fit what we want it to say. Then there's the parable of the mustard seed. How many have ever seen a mustard seed? A handful, and they're pretty small. So he presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the seeds, but when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Short little parable, but oftentimes this is looked at wrong. People often take this parable to be a representation of how the church is going to grow. That you sow the seed of the gospel and it's going to grow into this big tree and where even the birds find comfort in the tree. But if we really look at it and compare it to other things that Jesus said in the previous parables, we get a whole different picture. First of all, a mustard seed doesn't grow into a tree. That always baffled me about this parable. A mustard seed grows into maybe the size of a bush, but not into a tree. So this is something that has grown into something it wasn't meant to be. Speaking of a religious system that has grown into something it really was never meant to be. And the man who took and sowed, this is not talking about you sowing the gospel. Again, this man is Jesus. He is the sower. He sowed in the field, into the world, the gospel. But it grew into something it was never meant to be. So large it says the birds of the air came and nested in its branches. If you go back to the parable of the sower, the first parable of this chapter, the birds represented the demonic forces that came and ate the seed and took it away. So this is a religious system where even the demonic forces are comfortable nesting in this. So this is speaking of in the kingdom of God is talking about how and you look at these parables they're, they're really giving us a, an image of how the church is going to change and evolve over the time of church history. Similar to the seven letters in Revelation that give us a picture of the church, the different types of churches that would happen over the period of time that we know as the age of the Gentiles or what we're in right now the church history. We know that in the world the ch church has grown into something that, some parts of the church into something it was never meant to be. Where even false doctrine is comfortable nesting within that religious system. So this gives a picture of, of something that's not really that good. Something we need to watch out for. Now some would try to attach a particular church to this. I try to refrain from doing that. But we just need to look at church history to see that, that through church history, the church grew into something it wasn't meant to be. And the church was united with the state by Rome. And in that time, the church began to become a, a much more than just what it was meant to be. It became a political power in a sense. And offshoot from that that happened with the Roman church has come kind of many other denominations that have gone back to the Word of God. And so this is a picture of what has happened in the church. Then there's the parable of the leaven. Then he spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of flour until it was all leaven. Again, I've heard this preached on and say this is about us going out and sharing the gospel and how that when we share the gospel, the church is going to grow. <coughs> it's going to spread throughout the world. But there's a problem with that interpretation because leaven in Scripture never represented anything good. Leaven in Scripture always represented sin. Leviticus 2.11, it says, No grain offering which you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven, nor any honey in any offering to the Lord made by fire. So there is this 
I did. It tells us the leaven was not allowed in the offering, and three pecks of flour was the amount of flour that was used in the grain offering. Kind of interesting. It's also a very large amount of flour. That's enough to make a whole lot of loaves of bread, more than a family would make. So who is the woman? The woman does not represent Christ. The woman represents, oftentimes in Scripture, a woman represents a religious system. You look in the book of Revelation, the woman in Revelation is a representation of the world's religious system. And she's hid within the church, this leaven that has grown and spread throughout the church. The false doctrine that has been put into the church, there's a lot of false doctrine, a lot of leaven that has gone in the church and has spread throughout the church. So we need to be careful of false doctrine. There's a lot of warnings about false doctrine in the, in the epistles. Most of the epistles in the Bible were written to combat different types of false doctrine. It started early on in the church. Way back when the church first got going, false doctrine began to leak into the church. And you see, Paul's letters was constantly combating false doctrine that was being taught. And we need to watch out for that today. That's why it's so important we know God's Word. So that we aren't affected by the leaven that has gotten into the church, the false doctrine in the church. So this parable is actually a warning to us, just like the last one. Then there's the parable of the hidden treasure. There's two short parables about different kinds of treasure. When I read those, I said, well, why are there two? There's got to be a reason why there's two different treasures. What do they represent? And this is at the point where Jesus took his disciples aside. Now he's giving them these parables in private. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field. Again, we know the field represents the earth, the world. When a man which a man found and hid again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Well, who, who gave all that he had for the world? It was Jesus. You know that in John 3, 16, for God so loved what? The world. The world is the field. That he gave his only son, who whoever believed in him would not perish, but have eternal life. So Jesus is the man who found this treasure. But he hid this treasure in the world. Now, what does this represent? Well, a treasure in the scripture is always a reference to Israel. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandments, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So we know that this treasure that he found here was his chosen people, Israel. But for a time, he hid that treasure. And that's where we're at today. The treasure is hidden so that another treasure can be brought to the surface. God's not done until he's going to go back and get that treasure. He hid it to protect it. But we're in the age of the Gentiles where God is drawing in the Gentile nations. He has hidden Israel. He hasn't forgotten Israel. God is still working with Israel. If you come on Wednesday nights, we're going through the Revelation, and the Revelation is really all a focus on Israel. The church is not the focus of the Revelation. Israel is, because he's going to, in those last seven years, there's going to be so much persecution and stuff happening in the world that's going to force them to turn to God finally and cry out to him, and cry out to Jesus as their Savior. Because God has a plan for Israel. The Bible tells us that all Israel will be saved. But right now, they're set aside. They're that buried treasure. He's working on us, the Gentile nations, and drawing us in. I had conversations recently um, because of the news. My dad said, how come, how come people hate the Jews so much? And I went through it with Scripture and pointed out to him why. You go through the history of Israel... Every time Israel kind of messed up or tried to take things in on their own, in their own hands and produce offspring that they weren't supposed to produce, you follow those offspring, and those are the, the nations that hate Israel to this day. It goes back to uh, Lot and his two daughters having children by him, getting him drunk and having children by him, the offspring from those. 
are part of the Arab nations that hate Israel. You go with um, Jacob and Esau. They didn't get along. The offspring of Esau are some of the Arab nations that hate Israel. You have um, Isaac and Ishmael. Other Arab nations, they didn't get along. It's amazing if you read the Bible and then you look at what's going on in the world and you go, this has been going on for thousands of years. It's nothing new. It's a family feud. But Satan hates Israel. We learned that in our study on Revelation. Gave the picture of the woman in, in heaven that was trying to give birth to the son. That was a picture of Israel bringing forth the Messiah. And the dragon wanting to destroy the woman representing Israel. Because it was through Israel that Jesus came into the world. We see that hatred being acted out in the physical in this world. We just saw we need to pray for her. The synagogue that was shot up, 11, last count I heard 11 people, I don't know if that changed, that were killed. Like they're just going to church, celebrating the birth of a child, and somebody filled with this hatred that comes from Satan goes in, saying all Jews must die, and shooting up what is called the uh, Tree of Life synagogue. We need to pray for them, remember them in our prayers. Can't even imagine what that would be like, the grief. But the hatred that's in the world for this treasure, God's treasure that he's buried. Then there's another treasure. It's called the pearl of great value. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So the thing in common is the person seeking this treasure sold all that he had to gain that treasure. The pearl represents the Gentile church. Represents us. Jesus didn't just sell all that he had. He didn't just give his life for Israel. He gave his life for the world, for us as well. And if you think of a pearl, they're very interesting. They're, they start out with a little piece of irritation inside of the, could be a grain of sand or some type of irritation that gets into the oyster. And the oyster begins to coat it with shell material. Layer upon layer upon layer, and it grows big. It's more and more valuable the more layers that are added. That's how the church is. It started out very small, and it was an irritation to the world. Read the book of Acts. But layer upon layer has been added as we go through history. As more and more people come to know Jesus as their Savior, and it gets more and more valuable the more they come to know Him. Just like a pearl it gets more and more valuable the more layers. You add on to it. It says in 1 Corinthians 6.20, You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. That price was Jesus' life. He came and gave His life for us. And so often that just goes by us and we don't really think about what God did for us. To humble himself and become a child, to grow as a man, just to be killed, sacrificed for us, so that we might go to heaven. God could have just started over. And sometimes I read the, I read the Bible and why didn't he just start over? When Adam and Eve messed up, when Israel was rejecting, at some point along the way, they would have thought he'd just say, you know what? I'm just going to wipe this all out and start with something new. Because this isn't working. But his love is so great, he didn't give up. He provided a way to be with him. Then the final parable is the parable of the dragnet. Dragnet is a net that they throw out and drag through the water to catch fish and gather up fish into the net. <clears throat> It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, emphasizing that there is going to be a separation 
the good from the bad. When they gathered the fish up, they didn't keep the bad fish. They threw those out, kept the good fish. Bad fish, you burned them up. It'll be the same with those in the end. Those that accepted Christ and those that didn't, they're going to be separated. Some to eternal punishment. Does that mean? No, it's not. Because God, I believe, is every single person an opportunity to accept Him. We don't know what happens. I always believe that even in the moments of somebody's death, I believe that God is speaking to them. There's, in just moments, could be an eternity with God. I believe it's every single individual before they take that final breath an opportunity to respond. We may not see it conscious, you know, consciously watching them, but they're experiencing it. I just know that having been around people that were close to death, it just seems like there there is a different realm opening up to them. The first call I had as a pastor and had to go pray with somebody that was asked for prayer because they had cancer and were dying. And that day I was kind of wishing I wasn't the only pastor in the office. I mean, I was new in the ministry. It's like, oh, you know, I've only been in this position for a month and I'm already being called out to go pray with somebody. It was kind of a frightening experience for me. But called my wife, she went with me, went to pray with this woman, and Gail to this day says, I was amazed at the first thing you did is start asking her if she accepted Christ as her Savior. And I said, well, I looked at it, and I didn't think she had, I didn't think I had time to beat around the bush. <laughs> Make small talk. But I asked her, and she said she had accepted the Lord, and we prayed with her. And she asked us when we were leaving, she wanted us to, 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 to put her in front of her door, open door. She says, I just want to look outside, I want to be by the open door. And we left and we found out that she passed 10 minutes later. She knew. She knew she was going. I guess she didn't want to go through the walls. You know? Gail's father, similar experience when he was getting close to passing away. He could see it more. And he kept saying to me, Trent, you're a minister. Open that door for me. He was looking up and kept saying, open that door for me. And I kept telling him, I can't open it for you. He said, only Jesus can open that door. He had an opportunity to pray with him to accept Christ as his Savior. And he passed later that evening. There were some other things in conversation that God did with him that had to settle some real small account. So after we prayed with him to accept Christ as his Savior, then he started asking, he says, what's that, that commandment? What's that third, or that verse, that third verse? I'm thinking, what is he talking about? Maybe he's talking about the commandments. So I started reading through the commandments, and I got to, thou shalt not take God's name in vain. But you had a real problem with that. He said, that one. How do you stop doing that? And we just told just ask Jesus to forgive you for that. And he'll help you. And he prayed to ask Jesus to forgive him for that. And he went that evening. It was like, Jesus said, before I open that door, there's one little thing we need to deal with here. You've kind of been using my name in the wrong way. And we need to deal with that. So I just believe that People are given an opportunity, whether consciously or subconsciously. Um, nobody's going to stand in heaven and point the finger at God and say you weren't there. I just that's something I do know for sure. Those that go into eternal fire, eternal punishment, they go there because they have rejected God and they've rejected His love. They became so hate filled that they couldn't get past that. And that's why there's eternal punishment. It's not an unfair thing. It's something that people choose. Just as we choose to accept Christ, we choose, you can choose to reject Him. Everybody has that opportunity. Let's bow our heads for just a moment. I know that these messages, they go out online as well as those of you that are here. I don't know who all will hear this message today. But if you're here today and you haven't made that decision, you can make it today. There is only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus. And if you've not accepted Him, He's reaching out to you right now and saying, 
Accept me into your heart. Invite me into your life. I want to have a relationship with you. I want to be with you for eternity. If you've not invited Jesus into your life, and would like to do that this morning without anybody looking around, just slip your hand up. And I'll include you in my closing prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that are here this morning, Lord, and for all those that will hear this message. If you need Jesus in your life, accept him. He only wants to love you. The greatest love that we can ever experience. Jesus, help us to take your words to heart. To watch out for the warnings that were in these parables of the kingdom, Lord. We know that there's false doctrines that try to make their way to the church, and the best way to combat that is to know your word. Help us to be people of your word, Lord. To have a hunger and a thirst for it, Lord. Be people of the book. Lord, I thank you and I praise you so much that you preserved your word for us, and we have the truth right in front of us. Jesus, touch these that are here and bless them this week, I pray. Let your word ring true in their hearts this week. Go with them, guide them. Bring remembrance of scripture when they need it. I thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. In your wonderful name, amen. Amen. amen.